So we're going to continue our study through the Gospels, and um, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 19 and 20. I'm going to read portions of those chapters, um, then we're going to get into, and then I'm going to go back to them and make comment. Um, <clears throat> so Matthew chapter 19, the... It's a story that we all know, the, the rich young ruler, <clears throat> in verse 16, comes up to Jesus and says, Teacher, what good deed must I do to gain eternal life? And Jesus basically says, you need to keep the commandments. And the young man says, well, I've kept the commandments since I was little. Uh, I've always kept the commandments. And Jesus says, if you want to enter, if you want to be perfect, <clears throat> Go and sell all your possessions and give it to the poor and then come and follow me. <clears throat> when the young man, verse 22, when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he was very wealthy. At the end of that story, Peter, and I'm going to cover it more in a minute, but Peter asked Jesus, Lord, we've left everything to follow you. What will there be for us? That's, the, that's pretty much the end of chapter 19. And then chapter 20 opens with what we call the parable of the workers in the vineyard. <clears throat> so chapter 20, verse 1, Jesus says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. A denarius is a small silver coin, a Roman silver coin that was basically a day's wages. And so he hired a bunch of guys and sent them in the field for, and said, I will pay you a denarius, one silver coin for your work. He did that in the morning, and then he went back into the marketplace at noon, and he saw guys standing around with nothing to do, so he sent them to the vineyard. Same thing. And then he went at three in the afternoon. There's only a couple hours left in the day, and saw guys standing around. He sent them into the vineyard, and at the end of the day, he goes and pays everybody. Everybody gets a silver coin. And the guys at the end were unhappy with that. And they complained. And they said, wait a minute, we worked all day. These guys only worked three hours, and you're paying them the same thing. Verse 13, the owner of the vineyard says, I'm not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for one denarius? denarius? Take your pay and go home. I wanted to give everyone the same thing who worked for me today. Don't I have the right to do with my money what I choose? Or are you envious because I'm generous? That's fairly the that's pretty much the end of that parable. And then the very next part of Matthew 20, the next pericope, the next segment. The mother of John and James, the sons of Zebedee, come to Jesus and the mother says, Lord, I want James to sit on your right hand side and I want John to sit on your left hand side. And Jesus basically says, I don't, I don't think you know what you're talking about. I don't think you know what you're asking. And he moves on from there and basically does not give her, he doesn't grant her her request. And again, I'm going to come back to all this, all these passages. <clears throat> but he puts her off. And then verse 24 when the other ten disciples heard what was going on, they were indignant. They were angry at James and John for having the temerity, the audacity to come to Jesus and ask him to do that. And then Jesus ends Matthew 20 with a famous text. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. This is not the way it's supposed to be with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be a leader must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. So let's pray. Jesus, we ask you to open our hearts, open our ears, open your scriptures to us and speak. We want you to remain among us. 
We welcome you and we want you to speak to us this morning. Help us to hear you and obey you. In your name we pray. Amen. I get up on Monday, you know, not that you guys need to know this, but I work on my message for Sunday. I start on Monday morning, and that's the first thing I do every morning of the week. That's part of my spiritual devotional life. I get up, I spend, you know, now what time I get up varies, but I usually get up quite early, and I spend an hour to an hour and a half every morning of the week praying over, thinking through what am I going to do on Sunday morning. God, what do you want me to do, right? Monday morning, <clears throat> I'm thinking in my mind, well, you know what? I might not use a gospel message this Sunday, Lord. Give me, a, give me what you want me to do. If it's not gospel, it's okay. You know, just what do you want me to speak on? But I went to Matthew 19 because I've been reading through Matthew's gospel. And as you all know, I've been teaching mainly through Matthew's gospel. I don't know why, but I'm stuck there. And as I read these two chapters, these three stories jumped off the page at me. All three of these stories, in my opinion, seem to be speaking a message from Jesus to us. And the message to me seems to be that God is telling us, or Jesus is telling us, don't serve me so that you will be blessed. Don't serve me for what you're going to get out of it. That's another way, and I'm going to walk through the text, but that's another way where Jesus departs from the Mosaic Law. In the Law of Moses, anybody who remembers, when Moses presented the Ten Commandments, he started what became the Two Ways teaching. He gave him the Ten Commandments and he said, If you abide by these things, you will be blessed. You will be blessed with children. You will be blessed with prosperity. Your crops will be blessed. Your uh, livestock will be blessed. Everything you touch will be blessed. If you don't do these things, however, you will be cursed. You'll be cursed going out. You'll be cursed coming in. You'll be, you'll be cursed lying down. You'll be cursed rising up. Your crops will be cursed. Your livestock will be cursed. Basically, you're going to be messed up if you don't do these things. And it becomes a two ways teaching. If you serve God, you will be blessed. If you don't serve God, you will not be blessed. Jesus is turning that on its head all through his life, all through his, his, uh, his ministry. He does this, and we're going to see it, I think, quite clearly in these three stories. So Jesus confronts the rich young man, the rich young ruler who comes to him. And Jesus says, if you want to be perfect, go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. And the young man went away sad. I didn't read the whole text, but the disciples are like, wait a minute, what? What? You're telling him to sell everything and give it to the poor? That goes against everything we've been taught. Jesus this young man's kept the commandments. He said that all of his life. He's blessed by God. You're asking him to give away all of God's blessing in his life. And Jesus looks at him. Jesus doesn't apologize, does he? He looks at him and he says, it's very difficult for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. In fact, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to be saved. And the disciples say, well, how can anybody be saved? And Jesus says, well, with God, all things are possible. And then is when Peter looks at Jesus and says, Lord, we have left everything to follow. And indeed, Peter was a fisherman. He, had a, he, had a, he was a small business owner. He fed his family. He must have done okay. I mean, being a fisherman was a blue-collar job, but from everything we know from the gospel material, Peter would, did, did okay. He had a house big enough for a big crowd to come listen to Jesus. So he, he did okay. And some of his fellow disciples were fishermen as well. But Peter looks at Jesus and says, we left everything. What are we going to get out of this? And, and guess what Jesus does? He promises them that they will be repaid a hundredfold for everything they gave up 
but not in this life. He promised him blessing in the next life, not in this life. So that's the first story. Peter wants to know, Lord, what am I going to get out of this? And Jesus says, oh, you'll get a reward in the next time, in the next kingdom, but not now. So that's the first story. Then he follows that with the parable in the, of the workers in the vineyard. And everybody gets the same pay, no matter how long they work. Now the implication, and it's not in the text, it feels to me like the implication is, it doesn't matter how hard they work. It doesn't matter how long they work, they were given a silver coin. And some of the workers complained because they didn't think it was right. They didn't think it was fair. This is a very interesting parable because on the one hand, the parable seems to be promoting what we might call communism or socialism. Everybody gets paid the same. Doesn't matter how hard you work. Doesn't matter how long you work. You can get the same pay. In the typical interpretation of this parable, the silver coin is eternal life. And the idea is that I can serve God my whole life. I can do it as hard as I I mean, I can run the race with fervor and zeal. For 40, you know, for me, it's been 41 years now. And then some guy who lived a horrible life, lived like a just rank pagan, can give his life to Christ on his deathbed, and he gets the same silver coin I do. He goes, to, now, and listen, I'm just telling you, if I go to heaven and I meet people like that, God help me if I go, hey, wait a minute, you're not being fair, God. I served you all those years. The point of the parable is, you don't serve me for the silver coin at the end. You just serve me. You, you, we agreed that you would serve. Now serve me. And don't worry about what I give to the next guy. But I think it's also interesting. I just have to say this as a side note. We get a Judeo-Christian ethic in that parable that follows us to this day. And it's the underpinnings of capitalism. The owner of the vineyard says, don't I have the right to do with my money what I choose? And according to my, almost anybody who interprets this parable, who is the vineyard owner? God. And it lays the predicate for the idea that we hold whatever wealth in this world and it's ours to do with what we choose. It's kind of, a, it's kind of the underpinnings of capitalism, I believe. That's a side note. The point is, the story line is that you, you're not serving and looking at the next guy and what he gets out of it and comparing what you get out of it. You should be thankful that you're getting your silver coin. And if, and if the silver coin is indeed eternal life, I don't know about you, but I'm not going to complain when I get there. I'm going to be stinking happy with whatever God gives me because I don't deserve anything. I don't deserve a silver coin. I don't deserve a silver button. I don't deserve a house. I certainly don't deserve a mansion. I deserve nothing from God. I don't know about you, but I don't deserve anything from God. I'm going to be plumb happy to be there. I'm going to be thrilled to be there. Then the next story, this is an obvious one. The mother of Zebedee brothers comes to Jesus wanting him to put them in a place of honor and high authority. Why? Because any king has benefits. Being friend to any king has financial benefits and power. And she asked for her sons to be at the right and left hand of Jesus. And of course, Jesus tells her, you know what? That's not going to happen. You don't know what you're asking for. Can they drink from the same cup I'm going to drink from? And then I think if I remember the text, he asked the brothers that. He, he basically says, you don't even know what you're asking for. And he doesn't grant her her wish. But the point of me, the point for me in these three stories is that the other ten guys are angry with John and James for even asking that they would be pre give, given preferential treatment. If you look through the gospel material, there are several places, two or three at least, where the disciples argue about who's going to be the greatest in the coming kingdom. Who's going to sit at the right hand of Jesus? Who's going to be the, the first mate? So this is not the only time that the disciples argue about this. Because they're humans, like all of us. And then Jesus tells them, basically, I'm going to the very end, Jesus says, look, 
Whoever wants to be great must be a servant. Whoever wants to be the leader in this little crew, you guys, Jesus talking to his disciples, whoever wants to be the leader among you has to be the slave in the Greek doulos. Do not underestimate Jesus using doulos. It is a slave. Now, there are varying degrees of slaves in the ancient world, just like there are varying degrees of slaves in America, and just like there are right now around the world, there are slaves. <clears throat> you know, we, we, we denigrate our country right now because of the bad parts of our history. Slavery still exists all around the world. You go to Africa, they have slaves. You go to Asia, they have slaves. You go to South America, they have slaves. I think we have slaves right now in America, but none of us know about it. There are people being held against their will, doing things against their will. I mean, if nothing else, the sex slave trade is in America and is doing fine and dandy. And why we haven't shut it down, I don't know. But don't, don't underestimate Jesus using the word doulos. When he says that, the disciples, it stings their ears. Because nobody wants to be a slave. In the ancient world, you had, <clears throat> you had slaves that were treated like family, and they lived in the home, and they, I don't know why, we don't know why, but they were treated, and then you had the slaves out in the fields who were usually chained and had armed guards because they were going to run away. Their lives are misery. But when Jesus said, if you want to be the leader in this crew, you're going to be the slave, trust me, that meant something to those guys. That is Jesus looking at his guys who are arguing about who's going to sit on his right and left hand side, who's going to be blessed. Who's going to be most blessed under you, Jesus? And Jesus says, you want to be a slave? That's what it takes. That's what I'm doing. And if I'm willing to do it, well, who are you to think you're not going to have to do it? That's the way his kingdom is to operate. Now, does God want to bless you? Yes. I think he gets joy from blessing us, from blessing his children. I mean, anybody who has kids knows, and even if you don't have children, you know what it feels like when you give something to someone or you bless someone that they didn't ask for something or they didn't deserve it, and I, but you just, something moved you in your heart and you wanted to bless them. You wanted to give them something. It makes you, it brings a joy to you. I believe God feels that way. He wants to bless us. Okay, so the point of my message is not that God doesn't want to bless us. He wants us to prosper. Okay, he does. I've been praying for all of you that you would be blessed on your jobs. That you would be blessed. Some of you run small businesses like me. I've been praying that you will be blessed in your small business. And I believe God wants to bless us. But you know what? There's a place where we need to come. And these three stories, I believe, point to this. Where we stop serving him to be blessed. There's a place where he wants our blessing to be knowing that we're serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the Prince of Peace and the Messiah who gave his life for you. When you didn't deserve it, and you still don't deserve it. I oftentimes tell people, I was a pagan. But, I mean, you know, we, we, we could argue that none of us were, that we were all lost before we were saved. But, you know, I was an athlete in high school, and I was told after I came to Christ that at a fellowship of Christian athletes one night meeting, someone said, you know, who do we need to pray for that they'll come to Christ? And my name was called out. And several of the, my fellow athletes and cheerleader people scoffed and said, Al Baker will never get saved. He is hardened. He won't do it. And they prayed for me anyway. When I heard that story, I thought, wow, it would have been nice if one of them had just shared the gospel with me. Because none of them did. You know, and I was, there was a point where I was desperately trying to find God. I didn't know where he, I didn't know how. I deserve God's wrath more right now than I did as a 16-year-old person who was living my life doing whatever I wanted to do, drinking, smoking pot, and doing all kinds of stupid things and chasing girls and blah, blah, blah. I deserve hell more right now than I did before I became a Christian. Why? 
Because I know better now. I've experienced things in my life. I should not struggle with any sinfulness in my life. I shouldn't struggle with any temptation to not be obedient to God. When I feel Him leading me to do something, I shouldn't even hesitate. But I do. And I fail Him. And I engage in behaviors and actions and attitudes that I know I shouldn't. And I do it anyway. I deserve hell more now than I ever did. I would argue that you do too. I would hope that you could come to grips with that. But we must come to a place where we join the psalmist when he cries out, One day in your courts is better than a thousand days living in splendor among the wealthy and blessed. I would rather be a doorkeeper in your house than to live in the tents of the wealthy wicked the rest of my life. And again, that's the Old Testament covenant where if you do all the right things, you'll be blessed. And if you, if you don't, you'll be cursed. And the psalmist David is saying, I would rather be a doorkeeper in your house, O God, than to have all the wealth in the world. And we need to come to that place. There's a place where we need to embrace the joy of serving Christ because He deserves our worship, our obedience, and our service. We are the workers in the field who come back and complain that they only got a silver coin. That's us, you guys. He's the landowner, and we're, we should be coming back to him, and when he puts the silver coin, we should, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Luke 17, Jesus says, listen to this, this is me closing. Luke 17, Jesus says, starting in verse 7, suppose one of you has a servant, a slave, who's plowing the field and looking after the sheep, when he comes in, are you going to say as his owner, are you going to say, all right, come sit down and let me serve you your meal? No. No, you're going to say, rather, I know you've been working hard all day and I've been in here you know, eating grapes and sipping wine or whatever I'm doing as, a land, you know, as the owner of the slaves, but you know, I don't care that you've been working hard all day. Fix me something to eat. Serve me, and then when you're done, you can eat. Jesus is telling the disciples this, okay? He says, that's what an owner tells a slave. Will the master, verse 9, Luke 17, 9, will the master thank the servant for his service? It's a rhetorical question. And the answer is no. And then Jesus says, so also you, when you have done everything you were told to do, you should say, we are unworthy servants. We've only done our duty. That's something we need to embrace, you guys. Do I do it all the time? No. Do I have the attitude that I should have all the time? No. But that's, that's the call of Jesus, is that we embrace living for Him without thinking so much about how blessed we're going to be. The blessings will come, but man, you cannot serve him constantly worrying like Peter. Oh, what am I going to get out of this, Jesus? Let that take care of itself. Let's serve him with joy in our hearts, too. That's the other thing. You know, we don't get the attitude, oh, I'm going to be obedient to God. It's hard, and I don't like it, you know, but I'm going to do it. I mean, I don't know about you, but I want to serve joyfully. You know, I don't want to be that way. I want to serve him with joy in my heart because he deserves my obedience. He deserves me to live for him. He deserves everything from me. Somebody want to share? What's been pricked in your heart? I'm going to ask the, I'm going to start getting my guitar ready, but somebody want to tell me what, what you're hearing? What are you thinking? Are we just ready to sing them? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> what I want to urge you to do, we're not gonna, we're not, we're not gonna be in here forever, but I want to urge you to use the singing in our worship time to to respond.
however you want to respond. If you guys would stand, and, and we're going to start standing, but I want to encourage you after we start singing, do what you need to do. So you're welcome to stay seated, but please put yourself in front of the put yourself in front of the Lord and, and ask Him to reveal your heart and to help you. Let's respond to Him. You can turn. Uh, well, I guess you can turn. Them. You can turn the lights off out there though, if you like. 